Hello, hola, and buenas tardes. For today's discussion, please note that we are offering live translation. You get the look at the bottom of your Zoom menu. You can click on the interpretation icon to access it now. First and foremost, thank you all for joining us today for the What Work Cities Executive Conversation Series with Melissa Breda, Undersecretary of Evidence-Based Public Policy for the City of Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm Rochelle Hanks, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Managing Director of What Work Cities. What Work Cities was created by Bloomberg Philanthropies and is led by Results for America. Our mission at Results for America is to invest in making what works the new normal at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. For the past 11 years, we have worked with decision makers to effectively invest in programs and policies focused on advancing resident well being with a lens towards economic mobility. And the signature local program at Results for America is What Work Cities. We were created in 2015 to recognize and celebrate local government for their exceptional use of data to inform policy decisions, allocate funding, improve services, and most importantly, engage residents and stakeholders. At What Work Cities, we support cities at all points on their data journey with a first of its kind standard of excellence that shows how investing in data and evidence-based programming and practices can lead to more equitable outcomes for residents. We do this by setting a North Star on what good looks like. That's what Work City certification. And we complement that with providing capacity building assistance to support cities and their staff as they strengthen their data practices and invite them to be part of a network of over 200 cities in North, Central, and South America to exchange ideas and share best practices. And we're building momentum by celebrating cities and elevating why this work is important like today's conversation. For today's executive conversation series, I have the pleasure of being joined by Melissa Breda. Melissa Breda is an economist who has dedicated over 10 years to public service. What Work Cities had the absolute pleasure of working alongside Melissa and her team since 2022, when the city began their What Work Cities certification assessment which ultimately led to Buenos Aires becoming one of the first five Latin American cities to achieve certification, joining over 60 cities that have earned this distinction. As the leader of the Buenos Aires Innovation and Digital Transformation Team, Melissa has spearheaded cutting edge data policies and practices that get at the heart of this work, which is how we do best when we leverage data to enhance the resident experience in cities. A few of the highlights under the work under Melissa's tenure include reducing the infant mortality rate by 39% after analyzing healthcare data of pregnant women and using it to improve access to primary services by ensuring that women were within 15 minutes of a healthcare center to receive vital prenatal care, creating a 3D model of Buenos Aires to aid developers with clarity on neighborhood zoning regulations and codes, but also allowing residents transparently to see what development is actually permissible in their neighborhood. Transforming paved streets into green streets that not only provide more green spaces for residents, but also reduces traffic and captures stormwater. While creating one of the first chatbots for WhatsApp, Bati, which is a user-friendly and centralized way for residents to access 85 different city services. Today, we will learn more about these exciting initiatives and take a step back to see how Buenos Aires is paving the way and using data and evidence to improve resident outcomes. Thank you, Melissa, for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Rochelle, and thank you everyone who have joined um, our meeting today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here sharing our journey with you. Wonderful. Um, as we're chatting, everyone, please feel the pre feel free to put your questions in the chat and our team will queue them up for our question and answer session at the end. So let's get started, Melissa. Um, to start, I want to know what it means for Buenos Aires and other cities to be part of a global data network. As you know, what Work City certification program opened to cities in Central and South America last year. What do you think is the biggest benefit for Latin American cities specifically to join the network? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I know that probably uh, many of my Latin American colleagues uh, over here will agree countries in our region face common challenges, mainly those related to institutional weakness. 
And just by reading the news, we can see how complex and are uncertain the situations are in countries like ours, Argentina, uh, but Peru as well, Guatemala, Paraguay, among others. So since this problem affects the very core of our nations, the consequences extend to crucial aspects of our citizens' lives, such as employment and education. And these challenges also affect the private sector. According to many reports, Latin America countries have a staff turnover rate of between 5% and 10%. And um, there are some other indicators that show that around 31% of workers in the region are underqualified for their positions. So this mismatch of skills threatens to deepen in the context of the future of work and the technologies that we are starting to use um, today, such as Gen AI, for example. So as a consequence, I think that Latin American cities share the same day-to-day -day difficulties, training and retention of talent, generating quality data, and promoting that each team embraces evidence in their decision-making processes. And to address these challenges effectively, I believe it's crucial to work collaboratively at the regional level. And this is precisely what a network of cities like Wagor Cities proposes, makes uh, making the presence in, in, in the region so important. Um, finally, I think it's a proven fact that data management uh, plays an essential role in, a, in strengthening government institutions and promoting transparency. And uh, in this, we agree with our colleagues uh, from, from other cities. So that's why having the possibility to access the experience of other cities, learning from their journeys um, is, is helping us transform our governments into real data-driven organizations. Thank you, Melissa. And I think you hit it. Part of the network is recognizing that we all have similar challenges and that we don't have to go on this journey of loan of trying to solve for it. You can be part of networks that help you be able to share best practices and we can learn from each other. Do you have an example of when you were able to connect with and help another city make progress on its goals? Yeah, um, we from Buenos Aires, we aspire to be a lighthouse of innovation and, and expertise at a local level. And just recently, we had the opportunity to to collaborate with um, the team and authorities from uh, Luján de Cuyo. It's a city in the province of Mendoza to support them in their certification process or journey. And we also engage and, and talk very frequently with the city of Córdoba in a similar way. Both of these cities have made substantial progress and it brings us great satisfaction to be able to contribute to their journey. And um, this collaborative approach among Argentina cities can lead to the federalization of data, where data is collected and managed at different levels of government, ultimately benefiting our citizens and, and communities. We are also in contact with cities all across the Americas. As I mentioned before, regional collaboration is, is essential in this regard. Um, as a result of, of, of the What Works Cities Network Initiative, in a few days, we will have the honor of welcoming a delegation from the city of Pittsburgh and Monterrey to share some of our good practices with them. So we are very excited about this exchange of information and, and experiences. And we'll, we hope that, that this visit and the rest of the uh, conversations with the rest of the cities will, um, will continue to be mutually enriching for, for all of us. That's great. Uh, thank you for sharing those examples of where you've been leaning in, not only to help cities with certification, but you're thinking about collaboratively, how can cities support each other as a cohort, but also just being a leader internationally. And we're excited as well uh, for Pittsburgh and Monterrey to visit you uh, and learn from your practices. That's an exciting part of our program as well, is that real time uh, in real life conversations about data practices. Now I want to shift gears a little bit um, because everyone's excited about the city of Buenos Aires and what is happening. And so I want to share a little bit more with everyone who joined us today about your city's approach to data and how you've been able to really put into practice policies that focused on transparency, strengthening the resident experience. 
I want to start with like what motivated the city to really embrace open data as a strategic initiative. Where have you seen residents most responsive to the city's open data practices? Yeah, um, the city has been a pioneer in terms of open data. Um, we we became part of the uh, we became the first city in Latin America to be part of the OGP, the Open Government partnership um, and we launched our open data platform back in 2012 as well so it, it this this public policy of of uh, open data and transparency uh, goes back to almost 14 years so far and initially we followed a traditional approach which is um, this logic of opening data by default generally organizations public organizations need to balance uh, between quantity and quality. And at the very beginning, um, quantity was on top of quality, right? Um, but uh, over the past years, and we have talked about this with other cities and other organizations such as the Open um, the OD, the Open Data Institute and the OGP as well, we are, we are seeing a shift and we are as well a, in the course of shifting to an to a purpose to an opening with purpose opening with purpose so that means allocating our effort in data sets that are mostly demanded by the ecosystem or that we identify that are helpful to enhance critical economic areas of the city such as the real estate or transportation or even fintech so for this purpose we developed, as you were saying at the beginning, Ciudad 3D, as we call it in Spanish, or 3D City, that would be the, the translation, um, a digital platform that allows any user um, to visualize in three dimensions what can be built exactly in every plot of the city of Buenos Aires. It's a tool that <clears throat> translates in a very straightforward fashion the urban planning rules rules that were not digitized before. So as you can imagine, this platform is the result of a huge work of uh, algorithm generation and user-centric design. And um, there are two main characteristics that I always like to highlight about 3D City. One is that it's an open source platform and that means that any individual, any organization, but most importantly, any city around the world, in, in Argentina, in the region, can use it and um, put it into practice um, according to, of course, the urban planning, the local urban planning rules, or any individual can enhance it, you know, if they find uh, that there's something missing in the platform, that's the whole purpose of, of making it open. And on the other hand, it's based on the digital twin concept. I personally love this project because I think it's an example of how data can become a great ally for governments and organizations in general to be more efficient and enhance the user experience of citizens and in this case, the real estate professionals. Um, I could continue talking. I will just deep dive if we have enough time and in some of the indicators that reflect why C, uh, 3D City or Ciudad 3D has helped us become more efficient. And um, there are two indicators that are very straightforward and, and, and very clear. On the one hand, we have managed to reduce the processing time of construction project documents that went from 25 days to only seven work, working days. And the second one is that we have managed to reduce applications for planning certificates by almost 90%. And we have lowered the number of um, requests to our help desk by almost 60%. So all in all, um, with these in indicators in, in our, in, in taking these indicators into account and by taking a look at the number of monthly users that we get to the website, that are around uh, 16,000 compared to uh, previous platforms that had 6,000. We we believe that the that the project has been very well wel welcomed by users, and we are very happy to be very happy to know that. That's awesome, and I I think that you touched on something when you were chatting about a little bit about the state of 
the city in terms of its digitization uh, when you started. So I'm going to, you know, I think it's amazing that we should celebrate these accomplishments, but I think part of the story is the journey um, and getting to this amazing place with the outcomes you've seen with the resident engagement and improving process times. And so can you tell us a little bit about just the state of the city's data infrastructure and practices that you inherited and where did you even begin to manage your efforts? Um, to be honest, well, this, the undersecretary has uh, four years, it's four years old. We, we began uh, during the second term of uh, our current mayor, um, Horacio Rodriguez Larreta, and uh, to be honest, we 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 didn't need, we didn't know quite for sure. We weren't sure about where to start. But um, as as we started walking this journey, it it, it became very clear for us that um, it was mainly about driving a cultural change, a huge cultural change within the the government of the city. Of Buenos Aires, and uh, it hasn't stopped. Right, it continues to be a, a a task of embracing and promoting this cultural change. Um, and the main characteristic of this change is that we need to break down information silos, mm -hmm. the barriers that prevent the different areas of the government uh, from sharing and integrating data across across them. And to achieve this, we we did it with a triple approach. Uh, on the first, uh, firstly, we developed an ontological model. And just to make sure that, that everyone can follow me, uh, when I say an ontological model, I mean a structured representation of knowledge or concepts within a, a certain domain. And for, for, our, for our case or for us, it was public policies in the city of Buenos Aires, right? And this ontological model allows us to capture the relationship, the categories and the rules that bind these, these concepts. And uh, I, I emphasize this point because it was crucial for us to, to make this, this shift in our understanding of the data governance uh, strategy, because it helped us understand the main sources of information and data and the relationships between these sources. In, not in terms of uh, departments or governmental areas, you know, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Transportation, or the Ministry of Health, but in terms of um, actors, actors of an ecosystem yeah. that meant citizens, the government, the city, and the private sector, and how they they related, they, they were related, right? Um, so that, on, firstly, right, the ontological model. In the second place, we embraced technology. We, re we realized that the cloud implementation was the best option for us if we wanted to make this scalable and if we wanted to integrate such a large number of databases. Mm -hmm. And so we went forward and we created a data lake that is called Buenos Aires Intelligent Platform. Why? Because the data lake aimed and it has become over the course of, of the years a place where areas can can find different data sources and of course they can start analyzing the data so we decentralized these capacities and um, the data lake also allowed us to work with structured data I mean, when I, when I say structured data, I mean the data that comes from our open operational systems in Buenos Aires, but at the same time with unstructured data. And that's crucial because nowadays we are working with a larger number of unstructured data, data that comes from social media, images, audio, audios, and uh, conversations, for example, from our, our dearest uh, chatbot, Boti. So, um, I guess that, that those were the the main um, the pillars in that the, that we that we implemented. Now, and and thank you for giving everyone that overview of that foundation that you really created okay. on how to manage the data, structure it, um, and it, that's no easy feat. It takes time to build that. It takes vision, right? And there's lots of processes behind the scenes. But I think what's also important is you took the time to build that structure, right? And those foundational practices. 
but you also were able to tie it to outcomes for residents. You know, we often mm -hmm. talk about that at What Work Cities. We don't want you to have great organized data for data sake and pretty dashboards and have meetings, but how are you actually tying this to the resident experience in your city? And so I know you've done this really well in Buenos Aires. And so you can you share with us the process of like, how did you identify and select which citywide priority outcome areas you would focus on? Yes, you, you, you've you nailed um, you nailed it. Um, definitely, the process of selecting and identifying priorities is done uh, through what we call the government commitment plan. And um, for the rest of the people joining us today, um, to have some context, Horacio Rodriguez Larreta, as I said before, has been the mayor for over uh, eight years, for the past eight years. He's ending his second term in December. And uh, he implemented this, this government commitment plan. This plan is created or has been created at the beginning of each term. And it includes the key areas and projects that the city is going to pursue for the following four years. So it's a long-term uh, commitment that we are making here. And the plan is annually reviewed and communicated to the public to monitor its progress. There's a, in fact, an, a specific website that, that we have made public to track the government commitments. Anyone can uh, visit it and can understand how the city is doing. And um, thanks to this uh, government commitment initiative that began during Horacio's first term, he became the first mayor to publicly commit before his term started in the history of the city of Buenos Aires. And in his second term, he not only committed to goals, he believed in, but he also went out to ask the uh, citizens and the uh, organizations, I mean, the whole ecosystem of, of the city of Buenos Aires, what was it that they wanted to, the, the government to pursue, right? What projects, what initiatives? Um, and this gave rise to what we call uh, commitments 2.0. And our, these are commitments that have been co-created with the community. Um, just mm -hmm. to give you um, some information, extra information, by the end of this year of 2023, we 150 uh, commitments were made and 88% of them have been uh, achieved so far. So um, Horacio has certainly taken this this uh, public policy a step farther. Congratulations. That is an accomplishment. That is truly an accomplishment. And I think when I, our team had the chance to visit Buenos Aires and meet with you and the team, um, we were able to see some of this up close and personal, right? That level of commitment and that level of engagement with residents in the community to understand needs to best serve them. Um, and one of the places we got to visit was uh, the Barrio Mojica, uh, which is a historically vulnerable neighborhood where you created this reurbanization index to promote development. Um, it's one of the most fascinating projects um, I've seen. And, you know, I wanted you to share with everyone today. Can you kind of walk us through what that project entailed and the reurbanization index that you created? Yeah, yes, certainly. Um, the city of Buenos Aires, uh, the government of, of, of Buenos Aires has been working on urban integration for almost 10 years now. And um, the, in this context, there are two projects uh, that were implemented um, in Mojica neighborhood um, to foster the, the integration and the, the development of this area, uh, of this neighborhood. One. On the one hand, there's the reurbanization index that, that you that you mentioned, and this is a huge effort led by the Ministry of Urban Development. And the index consists in mainly two types of indicators. On the one hand, there are urban indicators, which include the access uh, to public transportation, urban mobility, access to healthcare centers, and then there's the second type of indicators that are housing indicators that are related to the access to public services like having water, electricity, infrastructure, property titles over the, the houses that, that have been built there. And um, 
then there's the this indicator and in addition to this to this index i would like also to comment uh, on what we call in spanish uh, catastro informal or informal um I, I just missed the word of catastro or that would be informal neighborhoods uh, project. Through this project, um, underserved neighborhoods in Argentina were uh, for the first time integrated into Google Maps with their streets and their shops. So this meant for us uh, that, that we started working uh, with Google's geospatial, geospatial data to make the streets in these neighborhoods visible on, on Google Maps. And we also added the street names and the street directions to enhance searches and routing to these specific uh, stores and, and houses and, and, and public uh, places, uh, public locations in, in the neighborhood. Um, for us, this was this was so essential, not only because it meant fostering a public private partnership uh, that, that we believe so much in, in, in this strategy, in this approach. We, 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 we are convinced about how important it is to, to rely on other actors of the ecosystem in order to develop and redesign better public policies, but also we are certain that integration starts in the community and that has to extend to the digital uh, arena, to the digital field, right? Visibility provides the opportunity for economic development in the neighborhood because we can promote their businesses and therefore by doing so, we enable real inclusion. inclusion. Um, so far, we all, we have almost 700 local shops that have been added to Google Map, and uh, this uh, visibility of uh, of commerce of um, stores has increased by almost 150 percent since we started the project. So we are we are very very happy with the outcomes as well. That's amazing. And how are the the residents? How are they responding to this effort? We have had the chance to talk with the with the neighbors, um, and we have also done some some films, and we have talked to them, and they are they are thrilled. They are so happy to be able to upload photos to promote their their stores, their um, their startups, you know, um, and they are gaining new customers, and they are starting conversations. Uh, they get reviews and they get more involved and uh, they are really, um, we've seen enthusiastic, we've seen them enthusiastic about this, this initiative, this project. Wonderful. Um, Melissa, over your career, what lessons have you learned about what it takes to actually transform internal city practices and effectively lead with data? Mm. Um, well, just as, as we receive constantly valuable information through the network uh, about practices imp implemented or lessons learned, um, I'd like to, sh to, to share with you what I've learned through this, this amazing journey, this not just this four year journey, but oh, the, this 10 years journey in, as, a, as a public officer. And um, for me, it's important in the first place to, to recognize, uh, to acknowledge that data is everywhere, but that the real challenge lies in encouraging ourselves and our teams to do things differently. And as data leaders, I think it's our responsibility to provide our teams with the skills in order uh, to enable them to build their own solutions to the problems that they are facing. In the second place, I think, it's essential to expand our perspective uh, because um, it it has positive influence in our behavior. When we consider the broader purpose of our actions, that inspires us, that motivates us, even during challenging and uncertain times, such as the ones we're living right now. In my case, this broader purpose is, uh, is very simple, but very powerful at the same time, and that's improving the lives of Buenos Aires citizens. And um, at the 
I guess in the third place at the undersecretary, we learned that becoming a data-driven organization is, is an ongoing process. It's not a final destination. And we always like to say that Buenos Aires transformation into a data-driven city didn't begin with uh, the birth of our undersecretary four years ago, but that that it's a process that started almost 14 years ago, years ago with those who preceded us, right? And um, finally, I think it's important to embrace the possibility of making mistakes because that's the only way to uh, improve uh, in a fast and, and to achieve outcomes very fast because we have very limited time uh, to transform the realities of our cities. So we need to, um, to, to become friends with this possibility of making mistakes. Yeah, and I think um, it's okay to fail. I like that you uplifted that, right? I think sometimes everyone thinks they have to approach this work and there's a perfect way. Um, and even the cities that work with us sometimes hesitate to work with us because they think they're not ready because they have to do it perfectly or the city has to be. And it's like, no, the beauty is in the journey. The beauty is in the work together, learning um, from the mistakes and the failures and how do you take what worked well from that and what didn't, and then you design something new and be in creating that sense of um, space to invent and be innovative um, and a safe space for staff to think creatively and know it's okay if a mistake has happened, I think is so important um, part of this work. In your response, you touched on two, you, two things. You mentioned that this work had started years before you, um, we're in office, but you also mentioned when you do come into office, there's a short amount of time to do a lot of work. Um, and uh, as a former public servant, I completely understand. <laughs> and so <laughs> I get that. And so I, uh, and I know you and I have had conversations about this. One of the things that, you know, are on the mind of a lot of our cities is how do you make sure the practices, the policies you put in place are sustainable, right? Like we want to make sure we continue to have sustainable data-driven city governments that are going to thrive across administrations. And I know with the What Works Cities program, that's always top of mind for us. And we're here to offer tips, but I want to hear from you. Um, and what can you share with everyone about how do you make this work sustainable? Yeah, right. That's uh, that's something that um, we should think of uh, almost every day uh, of our of our lives as public officers. Definitely, um, I think that in order to ensure um, effective and sustainable management, it's it's crucial that the public administration relies on tools and structures that um, endure within the, the organization that transcend us, right? As, as leaders, as public officers. And um, I think that data institu institutionalization, I, I don't, I, I think I made that word up, right? Institutionalizing data. Um, I, I I don't know if I did the literal translation. <laughs> I hope that those translating for us can, Make to can get it right um, is when I so I think that um, that's one of the key tools as it allows for for a consistent and continuous data collection and management and it's vital for making informed decisions and creating public policies that truly address the needs of the citizens. Um, I think that keeping a reliable and steady record of data over time makes it easy easier to see patterns and long lasting problems. And this helps those in charge of, of creating and designing or rethinking public policies based on evidence um, that, um, that can effectively address the issues and, and, and opportunities in society. I think it's, it's about establishing a certain level of data work that goes beyond our organization. And um, I think that the What Work City certification uh, as a standard um, and updating annually in its areas of assessment allows the cities to continue working on the, on the data um, using the already established framework. It's, 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 um, it's a work that we have to go through 
but um, and we always say as or we always feel at least in Argentina and I can speak for for local colleagues as well that we seem we seem always we always seem to 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 be short on time when it comes to documenting and to writing down in order to be able to um to to create this legacy and to pass it on to the to those coming after us um but um the going through the certification and and not being necessarily you know uh getting a 10 in in every aspect of the certification is really helpful in order to allocate uh, resources and focus and to devote time to to do that absolutely thank you you touched on a few things but things I want to uplift and highlight is embedding this work into policies and being able to document the processes and the work that you're doing. And I appreciate you leveraging, you know, certification as a tool, an assessment tool that can help you be able to strategically identify your areas of growth so that you can also focus on the work that you want to do in the year to tenure, but also leave a blueprint for the future. Um, that's wonderful, Melissa. Now I'm going to shift to questions um, from everyone who had joined us today. Um, the first question I got asked is, how to make the how do you make the population see value in the availability of open data, and how has the city of Buenos Aires encouraged the use of data by you know civil society? And are there any tips that you would share? Um, sure. Um, as I was saying, right, we we shift this approach from trying to make uh, all of our data sets public and um, that entails a lot of effort and um, it can be a bit frustrating because when you open data uh, then you commit yourself right to keeping it updated and sometimes um, and I can speak for Buenos Aires we started this journey with a lot of enthusiasm but I don't I'm not so sure that we had the tools to be able to keep up uh, with this updating, with updating these data sets, and uh, uh, to, to, I don't think we were able to live up to the expectation for 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 some time, right? So we shifted to this with to this purpose approach, and um, one one strategy that we implemented was to sit down and talk to the main stakeholders that represented these key areas that we were trying to target, right? The real estate, transportation, as I said, and FinTech. So we sat down with them and uh, we were able to tell them, hey, this is sort of our capacity. What can we do together uh, to address your needs? Uh, what are the data sets? Uh, we need to take into account the regulations as well. So um, informing and letting the, the stakeholders and the ecosystem as a whole know uh, what you can actually do and what you're not in, what is not in your capacities right now to provide. I think that's a good way to establish a, a very um, open and transparent conversation and a more mature mature relationship, right, between the government and, and, and the ecosystem. And um, we got very interesting insights. And it also allowed us to start exploring an exchange of information, because the original approach I was talking about, this um, open by default, is, all, is also a one-way approach, right? The government opens data to the community, to the citizens. Uh, but then the government does not require information or does not use information that the private sector or the citizens, well, yeah, the citizens, of course, because we we use the data that they generate in this interaction between the, the citizens and the government, but not from the private sector, which, you know, collects, the, the private sector collects a lot of information, a very useful one, because there is an alignment of incentives as well. I always tell this uh, this joke that probably supermarkets know my address better better than the government because I'm interested in getting you know my deliveries or maybe um, you know some Uber Uber Eats probably knows my address better than the government because there's a true alignment of incentives right out, out there. But again, we need to take into account regulations and we have to be very mindful about the, this 
exchange. Um, but this, you know, building this conversation and continuing this conversation, being open, uh, everyone out there in the open data community can reach out to me. I'm in Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I mean, they write to me through, they use every channel to ask some requests and we are constantly answering. Um, I think that's the best way to approach this relationship. Um, that's awesome. You you just gave a whole playbook. And so that that's a great response. I have one uh, last question here. It said, you discussed the importance of failure. Public servants are often under immense pressure to get it right, especially because we're dealing with public dollars. How do you help public servants embrace failure as an element of innovation? Um, I think it's a joint, uh, it's 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 a joint um, work or um, task. Uh, and when I say joint, I mean that everyone in all the levels in the organization need to be very mindful about what it takes. No, you know, to to make mistakes because um, it's very true what you were meant bringing up uh, from the question, uh, the fact that we are constantly exposed and we have to um, give public explanations uh, regarding almost everything we do, right? Um, but uh, what we do is we try to take this iterative or agile approach to to projects and um, we are constantly asked that means on the one side on the one hand and i will deep dive in this that you start building projects um from you know from very small from a very small size and you iterate and you you learn from these iterations um and that helps you and helps the teams and uh, everyone understand whether you are in the right track or you need to make uh, changes and you start making um, marginal changes, right? You don't go from zero to to the end from in one in, in one movement or um, you don't try to achieve the final project or try to understand from the very beginning what you're dealing with because the nature of, of public policies is uh, is a is a never changing uh, nature, right? Um, it's always evolving. The context is evolving. The the city, the citizens' behaviors are constantly evolving. So um, that's uh, that's I, I guess that's one tip of advice, you know, to uh, to to use an agile approach. And uh, um, I was I was thinking about the second one, and I I think I missed it, but. Um, yeah, the agile approach would be for us. Uh, yeah, I, I remember. Sorry, um, to to take into account asking some essential questions about um, what the needs of the client, who who your client is, of course, and what the real needs behind the request, and that's approaching it the project from a user centric point of view, uh, not trying to implement technologies or tools just for the sake of using that technology because it's um, it's very well branded or everyone's talking about it. So we need to go after this latest trend. Uh, of course, we need to be very aware of how the technology is evolving because it's rapidly doing so. And we, we may feel always that we're lagging behind. We are, we are, of course, um, um, but, uh, Sometimes, what I I sometimes I arrive to the to the very same conclusion when I take a look at different projects, and that sometimes it's not uh, the the solutions is not as complex as we thought at the beginning, and by asking some crucial questions regarding the need and and taking some time to explore there this this very question um, can lead to the conclusion that. Hey, we might just do with the less complex uh, solution or project, and we can then take it a step further if it's needed, right? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Melissa, for your your response. I think you nailed it when you said in local government it is ever changing, ever evolving, 
and there are always new challenges and crises, but there's also just innovation and opportunity. And part of embracing um, that and helping civil servants understand that it's okay to make mistakes is to be methodical about your approach, be agile in your approach, engage your stakeholders in your approach. And that allows for that course correction um, if it's needed. Um, but it also creates a wonderful space where folks are invested in the process and know that you are trusted with precious government dollars, right? That, um, and you serve the public, but if you are open and you're agile and you're communicating, people know that your heart is in the right place. Um, and you're doing work, not just for the, the purpose of rolling out technology or rolling out really great dashboards, it's in service of them and in service of improving their lives. And so we are at Certainly. the end of, yeah, we're at the end of our time. These always go so quickly, um, but Melissa, <laughs> you know, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for joining us today. I <laughs> wanna thank everyone for joining us. We encourage you to stay connected with What Work Cities, but also stay connected with Melissa to continue to learn more. You can engage with us by signing up for our newsletter. Um, which again has global leaders like Melissa um, featured and you can connect with them. We also will share more details in the chat on how you can stay in touch with What Work Cities. I wanna thank the What Work Cities team, Nana, Catherine, Marissa, Molly, and Cheryl. I also want a special thank you to the Bonas Artists team, the innovation and digital transformation team for making today happen. And Melissa, you know, um, my heart goes out to you. You are amazing. Extra special thank you to you for your service to the city, but also just being a champion of how to leverage data in service of people, because that is what brings all of us to this work. It's in service of people. And so thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining us and for the so so interesting questions. Uh, and um, thank you for your words. Um, it's all about um, it's all about that. Uh, so it's it's been a real pleasure uh, being part of the the Wild War Cities uh, Network community. Um, we we have had some very insightful conversations with everyone we have had the chance to talk to. So we are all together in this in this journey. I hope we can continue learning from each other. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thanks.